Well, hello and welcome to the third um, AS chemistry session for the Caralam Cymru Spring 2024 season. Um, as that first line, slide outlines for you, I'll be focusing um, today on instrumental analysis, which will therefore cover the content of topic 2.8, um, part of course of unit two of your AES course. Now, if you've previously tuned in to the previous sessions this um, season for 2024, um, then you'll already know my face. But those of you that haven't quite um, got round to watching the first two sessions, my name is Mrs. Stevens and I am a chemistry teacher in Escobro Peder. So as I outlined, this is the third session of the four pre-recorded sessions, um, the first of which was based on radioactivity and ionisation energies. Um, the session last week, um, led by my colleague Mr Black, was um, giving you an insight into Gavometric Practical. Um, and the last session next week will focus upon making up a standard solution and titrations and will again be led by my colleague Mr Black. So as I mentioned, I am going to primarily focus this evening on 2.8 and how you can use the um, analytical techniques outlined and studied during this topic to identify certain compounds. Now, we're going to be focusing on how you can use mass spectra, infrared spectroscopy in structural identification. I will also then be running through the content of how you can use NMR, both low resolution hydrogen NMR and carbon 13 NMR, again in how you can use it for structure identification. So going back to mass spectrometer, the first content I said I'd be covering, well hopefully um, you're quite familiar with the um, construction of a mass spectrometer, but if not, uh, mass spectrometry is a technique that's used to identify different elements and in doing so you can also find the relative isotopic masses of elements as well. Okay, so used to identify the molecular mass of a molecule and it fragments ions from that mole molecule. So these can be used then in conjunction with other information, such as infrared, such as NMR, um, and then hopefully you'll be able to determine the molecular formula of any unknown molecule, a technique and a question of which I will be covering later on in this session. So as I said, this is probably a familiar diagram for you, and it's the build-up of the mass spectrometer itself. OK, now the mass spectrometer is a device that's hopefully um, you're familiar with, but it's a device for finding the mass of atoms and groups of atoms. OK, um, I'm not going to read every single slide for you, but feel free because it is um, pre-recorded. Feel free to pause the presentation at any point and read it in more depth. It'll also give the opportunity possibly just to refer back to any content that you've got. Um, yourself, so your class notes, any revision uh, materials you've prepared, etc., just to get a bit more clarity if needed. So, how does it work? Well, it it follows certain stages, and the first of which is ionization. Okay, so the molecule is ionized. Um, it is then accelerated using um, electric field, and it is then deflected using a magnetic field as the third stage. Once all those three um, stages have taken place, it is then possible to detect um, and the beam of positive ions passing through the machine is detected electrically then. OK, now, as I said, I'm not going to go through it in too much depth. You've probably covered it previously in your own lessons, but if not, um, it surely will be done before the summer. But the Royal Society of Chemistry has a wealth of resources as well. And in this case, has an excellent video on YouTube that you, you might um, find really useful if you need a bit more clarity on certain aspects of what I've outlined there for you. So the link is um, given to you below. So when you are going through the PowerPoint, feel free to just click on that and it will take you directly to that excellent resource on YouTube that's been pre prepared by the Royal Society. So how does it used um, to identify um, isotopic masses? One of the uses, as I outlined there. Well, one of the uses um, is, as I said, calculating relative isotopic mass. So below is a mass spectrum for zirconium. So if you look at the mass spectra, um, for any element, the mass um, M divided by Z is expression will be the atomic mass. So the mass spectrum shows there are five um, peaks. 
the largest or the highest peak is always equal to the um, molecular mass in the case of molecules. But if you're trying to identify isotopic mass of an element, then you must carry out a calculation as so. So it gives you the percentage abundance of all those different isotopic masses. You simply multiply it by the atomic mass. Add them all up together and divide by 100. Now you divide by 100 here and um, I'll just quickly point this out to you. Um, you carry out the calculation and divide by 100 because obviously it was expressed as a percentage abundance. Now there are some occasions where they'll express the abundance as a fraction, so they might say that it's two thirds something and a third something else, in which case you divide by the total of that fraction. So if, you, if it's expressed as two thirds and a third, then you divide it by three, okay? But most of the time, um, I have to say that the WJC do tend to give it as percentage abundance. So identifying organic compounds. Now, this is um, the type of question that often falls into unit two because obviously you've got quite a heavy organic content that um, comes before 2.8, of course. So when an atom is bombarded by high energy electrons, it loses one or more electrons and forms positive ions. So when an organic compound is therefore bombarded, um, a great number of things will then um, inadvertently happen. OK, so it gets fragmented. So organic molecules do not hold charge very well and the ions break up or fragment. And in doing so, they break into break up into smaller ions and neutral fragments. They do this in regular patterns, and that is worth noting. OK, so the molecular peak is always exhibited as M plus. OK, so it's, it's described as being the molecular ion. OK, and it contains a small amount of excess energy from the bombarding electrons. OK. Analysis of the charged particles in the mass spectrometer gives the mass spectrum of that molecule in completion then. OK, so for example, I've got here a mass spectrum of ethanol. First thing to note, OK, we have got the highest peak in the region, um, as you notice there, OK? So you'll notice that you've got a peak at 46, 45, 31, 29 and 50. Now, when you are approaching such questions as mass spectra, I always advise my own pupils to, instead of trying to build a molecule that is the mass that they're looking for, is to use subtraction as a guidance. So we know that the highest peak, in this case, 46, is the molecular peak. And therefore, it is worth noting then what has been lost in order to fall down to the next peak. So in the case of the mass spectrum for ethanol, you notice that you've got um, a drop down to 41, which is simply a subtraction of one. So it's likely that you have fragmented off a single proton. OK, um, a drop down to 15, 17 and 31. So it's a different approach as opposed to just trying to figure out what 29 is. Try figuring out what has been lost from the uh, molecular ion itself in order to create that mass. So ethanol here, as we know, the molecular peak um, or the molecular ion is 46. The next one down then we saw was 45. So what could possibly have led to that? Well, it's a loss of one in mass and therefore you assume therefore that you've simply lost that um, proton of the OH. And in doing so, you've simply created a um, iron that's got a mass of 45. Now, the next one we identified there was um, falling down to a mass of 31, which is therefore a loss of 15. Now, 15 is worth noting. It's quite a common one and it is quite a good one to have as a reference. It is called a methyl iron. OK, it's likely being created by the loss of a methyl fragment um, being lost. OK. Then the next one we had was falling down to 29. So what could possibly have resulted in a drop of 17 from the molecular iron? Well, if you look at 17, again, if you focus on the fact that it is an alcohol, it is therefore not um, a shock, therefore, that is easily lost or fragmented as a um, fraction of it. And therefore, it will le lead to the OH being lost in completion. And then you've got the last one we refer to there, which is 15. As I said, 15 is classically referred to as a methyl ion. 
and it is a good point of reference. If you see that something has a um, fragment of 15, it's likely to be just that part of the carbon chain that is fragmented off. So there is another example here for you for propyl monol. Same approach I took again. If you look at the molecular peak, in this case it was 60, look at what the drop in mass is in each case. Um, and then you'll be able to hopefully fragment off bit by bit what is therefore being lost. Now, the point of focusing on the fragments is that they're like pieces of jigsaws that you figure out what the fragments are. And then at the end, hopefully, with other supporting evidence like IR or um, NMR or empirical data, um, you can then put those pieces of the jigsaw back together, hopefully, um, and then come up with a sensible um, identity for your unknown organic molecule. So, as you can see there, this is quickly going through the one for um, propanol. OK, you can then work out what each fragment was and put them all back together. You might be able to then establish that the original molecule was there for propanol. Right now, don't forget, OK, um, that we do study halogen alkanes, etc. And if there is a chlorine or a bromine atom that have got common isotopic forms, OK, you often get two peaks for the molecular ion, therefore, um, and some of the fragment ions. This is because both chlorine and bromine, as I said, exist as common and stable isotopic forms. Now, for example, if you therefore look at two chloropropane, you've got a peak at 80 and 78, which equates then to one of the chloropropanes having a um, chlorine 35 and the other one therefore having the 37 isotopic form of chlorine. OK. So that, as I said, is a bit of a whistle stop tour of mass spectra. But as I said, the um, resource by the Royal Society of Chemistry is a fab one and is well worth a watch. Even if you think you're confident, it's not too long a clip and therefore would probably be beneficial for all of you to look at that link that I gave earlier on. Right, IR spectroscopy. Now, we did do this, um, those of you that did triple award in GCSE. So, I'm for red spectroscopy was um, basically done, I would say. It was a much more straightforward um, approach taken in GCSE. And again, however, the Royal Society do have an excellent video that if you want further clarity or more explanation is required, then please feel free to click on that um, YouTube link that I've put below. And as I said, it is prepared by the Royal Society of Chemistry. So it is very accurate, very um, therefore relevant to your studies. Now, I'm not going to go um, into too much detail and read this in great depth for you, but infrared um, spectroscopy arises from the fact that you've got different covalent bonds present in organic compounds, of course, and they will behave um, in different ways to different um, frequencies. OK, so the frequency of vibration can be found by detecting when the molecule absorbs electromagnetic radiation. OK, so um, these covalent bonds can stretch or they can bend. OK. Now they can um, they can be symmetric stretching that occurs, and sometimes they can be asymmetric stretching as well. Okay, so that's um, using water as a point of reference there for you. Um, and these bonds, as well as stretching, can also bend. Okay, now that is the buildup and the different processes that take place within the infrared spectrophotometer. Um, but you can pause and read that in more detail if you so wish. OK, now what are the uses of them? Well, there are certain absorptions that are kind of characteristic of certain um, families. So the presence of bonds like OH and the carbonyl bond, cesyl bond O within a molecule are very commonly confirmed by the use of IR because they have these very distinct, very kind of characteristics um, absorptions that you can identify. OK, so interpreting um, them, basically you need to be looking at where the infrared has been absorbed and then you have that very valuable data sheet, of course, that you need to then refer to and look at what that um, absorption is likely to represent. OK, 
Um, as I mentioned when I was going through the mass spectra, these techniques are most commonly used not as a standalone method of identification, but in conjunction with other methods. And it's all the um, evidence used and looked at as a overview that is often um, the breakthrough in being able to identify them. So they're used in conjunction with NMR, like mass spectrometry and um, empirical data. OK. Now, the, this is the um, section of the data sheet that I referred to a few slides back. OK, so this will be supplied. You do not have to um, memorize any of them. OK, but I would say that I tend to encourage my pupils to kind of remember that peak in particular. So if you've got a characteristic absorption in around 3000, then it's likely to be due to hydroxy group presence. And the other one that is kind of characteristic is this one here that again, I very much encourage my pupils to remember. OK, so if you've got an absorption at around 1700, it's likely to be due to a carbonyl bond, C double bond O. OK. Now, interpretation, therefore, well, you'll see then that you have what is called um, absorptions given in. Usually uh, it is data that's given to you from a um, graph. So if the graph isn't always supplied for you. They might just say there was an absorption at etc. OK, so. The IR spectrum of a carbonyl compound, as I said, it is usually characteristic that you've got that absorption in the area or region of 1700. OK, so that is one of the two that my pupils are very encouraged to learn off by heart because it saves that little bit of time in exam possibly just to refer to the data sheet when possibly it's not necessary okay a um although as i said you can clearly see that it's got an absorption there of a carbonyl peak you can't yet tell whether it is due to a aldehyde or a ketone, or you may well be as part of another family that you'll come across called ester groups. OK, in order to differentiate and identify for kind of certain which one of those that it is, you'd need further evidence. So alcohol, the other one I said, it tends to be a broad absorption that is worth noting as well for an alcohol. But again, it's in that expected region of about 3000 um, as a whole. OK. Now, a carboxylic acid would therefore you'd expect to have an absorption in both regions. So because it contains a C double bond O bond as well as a OH bond, you'd expect the absorption in both. OK. So that is how you'd then be able to differentiate between the two. An ester, I'm not going to dwell too much on because you don't study them in great detail in year 12, but an ester um, would therefore have the expected absorptions in 1700 because that it would be classic then of the C del window, as I said earlier. OK, right. So if it's got an OH stretch and nothing else, it's likely to be an alcohol. If it's got a C del window stretch, it's likely to be an aldehyde or a ketone. And then if it's got an OH and a C double bond O, then it's likely to be that carboxylic acid as an identity. So th this is just a summary slide um, of the characteristic frequencies that you might see. So that is more of a visual um, interpretation of that data sheet that would be supplied to you in an exam. OK, now infrared spectroscopy can be used to help determine if an unknown alcohol is a primary or secondary alcohol as well. OK, so that is because the alcohol is firstly oxidized under reflux and then the IR spectrum of the product is then taken. Now, because you can only oxidize a um, primary alcohol all the way to an alcohol, uh, sorry, a carboxylic acid, then obviously that would allow you to identify um, and differentiate between the two classes as well. OK. Um, NMR spectroscopy then. OK, so NMR spectroscopy. We're going to cover very briefly both the proton NMR as well as the carbon 13 NMR in structure identification. So protons and neutrons can be regarded as spinning about their axes. And in many atoms, these spins are paired against each other. And so the nucleus has no overall spin, which would be the case for carbon 12, of course. But in some of atoms such as hydrogen, and carbon 13, the nucleus has an overall spin, and that's because there is an imbalance between the protons and the neutrons within that nucleus. Okay. 
So nuclear spin, um, usually the two possible spin states of the nucleus have the same amount of energy. However, in a magnetic field, the two spin states have different energies. Right, there is always going to be a um, calibration necessity for um, this technique. So samples are usually dissolved in solvents three of therefore um, hydrogen um, atoms. So classic solvents would be like CCL4, CD, CL3, etc. OK. And that's simply so you can then eliminate um, what would be kind of data that would suggest the presence of something that's actually not there would be the solvent itself. Carbon-13 NMR, the number of peaks tells us the number of different carbon environments in this case. So the chemical shift value gives the environment for each carbon. But you please, please remember an environment is simply that. It's an atom bonded to different atoms or groups. Um, and again, your data sheet gives all the chemical shift values and you do not therefore need to memorise them. So you'd be supplied with this data here. OK. So. As an example for you, you've got the carbon-13 spectrum there for hexane. Um, you've got three primary peaks that you can identify there. So there are three environments in that case. So there are carbons in three different environments. Um, and in the case of that compound, the A would be identified by the methyl either end of it. And then the B would be um, the neighbouring carbon either side of that carbon chain. And then you'd have the central carbons representing a different environment. Again, that's because each environment is dependent upon what's either side of it. It's called the neighbouring um, environments. OK. Right. There are other examples, but um, of course, you've got the availability of this to kind of go through at your own pace. So I'm not going to dwell too much on them. OK, but please, please go back to the PowerPoint that um, is also supplied and go through the slides um, at your own pace so that you've got time to really process what is going on. OK. I've got a load of examples there for you just to get through the clarity for you if needed. So low resolution um, proton NMR. Once more, the number of peaks tells us the number of different proton or hydrogen environments. OK, the data sheet supplied there would tell you. Um, and again, you do not need to memorize these at all. OK, in a spectrum, um, there is one signal for each set of equivalent hydrogen atoms. So the intensity of each signal being proportional to the number of equivalent hydrogen atoms that that represents in that case. So this is the low res um, NMR spectrum for ethanol. OK, and it does, in fact, enable you to identify um, the hydrogen atoms quite easily. So for that spectrum, the smallest peak um, represents a single H in the OH group. Um, and it's got an integration of one because obviously there's only one hydrogen of that nature, of that type. You've then got the middle peak there that represents the hydrogen in the CH2 group. OK, and because there are two hydrogens of that type, it has an integration of two. And then the third one here, OK, it has the largest peak and it represents the hydrogen there from the methyl group, part of the um, carbon skeleton. Um, and therefore has an integration of three because as you can see there are three of that type of course okay propan 2 all first thing to identify is that actually there's only um three environments still okay even though there are a greater number of protons that you can see in that compound because this and this are equivalent environments, they would therefore um, only produce one peak. OK. So you can see that you've got one there that represents the OH, you've got one that represents the two methyl proton environments, and then you've got the hydrogen that's directly bonded to the same carbon as the hydroxy group. OK. Right. There are more um, examples there for you um, that takes you through the expected ratio and number of peaks for different um, organic compounds. 
OK, this is the kind of summary of the main things that you therefore need to be aware of. So first off, the number of signals is how many different sets of equivalent hydrogen atoms there are. Position of signals then is indicative of the environment that it's in and you therefore need to refer to the data sheet. And the relative intensities then gives the ratio of hydrogen atoms for those peaks. So it tells you how many of each um, type of um, protein there are in each environment proportionally. OK, so it's a ratio. So if there are six of one type and two of another, then it would actually be a ratio of three to one. OK, now I'm going to focus on this. I called it a very challenging exam question, and it's basically to see whether you have a decent understanding of what I've covered so far. It's also very, um, I would say, atypical of the type of question that you may very well face in the exam. OK. Now it's a commonly what I would call a builder question. So they give you quite a wealth of information and they then ask you to work your way through it. And that is the key thing here is work through it in a logical fashion. OK, so this is the question. Um, so chemists are investigating an unknown compound X. They obtain information from a variety of sources. So compound X contains certain percentages of different elements. OK, you can see that that it's 61.2 percent carbon, etc. I'll come back um, in a minute to break that down because I'm going to take you through the approach I would advise you take to such a question. OK, it then follows up with a um, series of information like solids, sodium carbonates added to the aqueous solution and effervescence is observed. There are five peaks in the carbon um, 13 NMR. One mole of X reacts completely with a certain mass of bromine. So in a way, it is best to um, approach each piece of information bit by bit in an orderly fashion. And then, as is usually the case, you take all the evidence and you kind of combine it all into one um, kind of definitive answer. OK. So as I said there, use all the data and that is the key thing. OK, they often have that as part of the question. And even if you get the right answer, if you've not addressed any of the data or information that they've supplied you, you will inadvertently lose marks. OK, so if they try to use all the data, you have to refer to it in some way. Um, even if you've got the right answer, um, omission of any data reference will be penalised. OK. Right, so the very first thing, OK, as I said, it is always sensible to dress the evidence in the order in which it has been provided to you. OK, so in this case, the very first thing that was provided to you, of course, was the empirical data. OK, so in this case, compound X contains this much carbon, this much hydrogen and this much oxygen. Um, it wasn't the case um, for this question, but they um, do sometimes also state contain this much carbon, this much hydrogen and the remainder was another element such as oxygen. OK, so that would just require you possibly to do a bit of subtraction um, in order to get the percentage of the third or fourth element mentioned in the question. OK. So in this case, because that was the first thing that was applied, let's work out the empirical formula of the compound X that we've been given. OK, so in this case, it would have been dividing each percentage by the um, relative atomic mass. So the percentage carbon by 12, percentage of hydrogen by 1.01, .01, percentage of oxygen by 16. And it gave you the answer breaks down of 5.1, 6.04 .04, 2.04. OK, now you then divide each of the answers by the smallest one provided. And in this case, it would have given you a ratio of five to six to two. OK, because initially it would have given you 2.5 to three to one. Well, we know we can't have half an atom, so you would have been expected to scale that up from two and a half to three to one to five to six to two, which gives you then this information from that initial empirical data. So it gives you the empirical formula being C5H6O2. Now, the second bit of evidence that was applied to you was the mass spectrum. OK, now the most useful information or the first thing that you need to refer to then is that very top peak. OK, 
So we know, okay, that the highest peak is the molecular peak. So we know that the mass of the compound X is given as that highest peak, okay? So in this case, it was 98, so it means that the molecular formula is the same as the empirical formula. And that's because if you add up, if I go back to the data supplied, if you add up the mass of five carbons, six hydrogens and two oxygens, it very conveniently in this case gives you a mass of 98, OK? Which tells you the empirical is equal to the molecular formula. So you'd get a mark for stating that, OK? There's a peak at 14. So 14 could be well explained as being a peak at CH2, got a peak at 27, got a peak at 45, peak at 58. Right, here's the question that's often asked to me by my pupils, do I have to explain all the peaks? And in reality is, no, you don't. As long as you refer to the mass spectra data in some form, I would say that this is probably the only one I would be surprised um, at anybody omitting, I would say that omission of the molecular peak would be foolish. So refer to the molecular peak because it often then allows you to link the empirical and molecular formula. And then try to explain some of those molecular, um, sorry, not molecular, some of those ions as well. OK, so try explain some of the peaks, but you don't necessarily have to explain all of them. OK. So following that mass spectra, what we were then given was the information that sodium carbonate was added to aqueous solution of X and effervescence was seen. Well, we know the sodium carbonate can be used as a definitive test for a carboxylic acid. And it is therefore suggestive of the presence of the functional group COOH. OK. Following that, you were told that there were five peaks in the um, NMR spectrum. That tells you that there are five different carbon environments. OK, being that we are also quite confident about the fact that there were five carbons in the entire molecule. OK, it then allows you to um, work out another piece of the jigsaw. And then finally, you were told that you had one mole of X reacting with 320 grams of bromine. OK, well, bromine is used as an indicator for the presence of unsaturation, of course. So it indicates the presence of a C double bond C. Now, the fact that um, it reacted with 320 grams, you needed, therefore, to work out how many moles of bromine that was. OK. So we know that 320 gram equates to two moles of bromine, Br2, and each unsaturated double bond is um, indicating that there's a presence of one double bond, okay? Because it will react with one mole of bromine, will react with one um, double bond C, C double bond C, okay? So that tells you that there must therefore be two unsaturated bonds or two C double bond C bonds within molecule X. OK, so putting all the evidence together, that is what they then expect you to do. They expect you to take all the evidence and they expect you to collect it all into a kind of summary at the very end. So we know from all the evidence that the molecular formula is C5H6O2. We know that it has a carboxylic acid presence due to the reaction with the carbonate. We know that it contains five different carbon environments from the NMR. We know that it contains two unsaturated C of one C bonds. And therefore, you can conclude by putting all of that data together, as I said, like pieces of that jigsaw, you can establish that it therefore must be the molecule CH2, CH, 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 O, O, H, okay? So it's all about putting all that evidence together and concluding what it is likely to be. Right, so I've got a few additional past paper questions here because very often the best way of seeing whether you've got clarity and whether you understand this work is by trying your hand at these past paper questions. OK, so this is comma day has a composition of 31 again. They're quite predictive in their approach. OK, they often this is often the approach. They will give you empirical data. They'll give you mass spectra 
OK, and from that you can then um, work out what it is likely to be. OK, the following questions then were things like state the molecular formula of compound A. Well, if you look at it, what we have um, here is the ability of working out the empirical formula from that data. OK, it then asks you for the molecular formula. Well, that is just then a case of working out whether the empirical formula's mass is equal to the molecular peak of the mass spectra or is it half of it or is it a third of it, etc. So you scale it up. So if a mass um, of an empirical formula is 20 and the molecular peak is 40, then you double the empirical to get the molecular and vice versa. OK. It then led on to a bit of an add on question there, said the peaks of 77 and 79 are in a three to one ratio. Suggest the formula for each of these ions and then asks you for a displayed formula of the two isomers that fit the information given to you about compound A. OK, so if I look at the mark scheme for what came up in that um, year, OK, it asks you to do exactly the same approach, divide the percentages by the ARs and it gave you a ratio again. If you notice 1.5 to 3 to 1, can't leave it as 1.5, so you must double it so it takes it up. So this one you'd have to multiply by 2 and that will then feed into the empirical being C3H6Cl2. OK, if you then add up that, it gave you the mass of the molecular um, peak in the mass spectra, OK, which told you that they were a one to one ratio. So you didn't have to do anything. The empirical formula was equal to the molecular formula in that case. The two peaks, as I mentioned earlier, it is always useful to keep in the back of your mind when you've got halogenoalkanes is that chlorine and bromine as well in this case would exhibit isotopic presence because they've got two stable isotopes um, and therefore you've got carbon sorry not carbon chlorine 35 in one peak and you'd have chlorine 37 representing the other one and for that reason these are two suggested displayed formulas for the two isotopes present. So you've got them on either end of the chain or you've got them central and one at the end of the chain. Compound C, compound of carbon, hydrogen and bromine only. Bromine has two isotopes in equal abundance. Use the information below to deduce the structure of compound C, given, giving your reasoning. So again, they've given the empirical data. They've given you mass spectra. In this case, they gave you infrared spectra information as well and asked you to also consider the fact that compound C was a Z isomer. OK, so it brought in geometric isomerism and your knowledge of that from topic 2.4, if I remember correctly, when you did hydrocarbons. OK, so I've included, as is the case throughout this presentation, I've included the mark scheme there for you as well. So that you can um, attempt them independently and then check your understanding. Now, this is just a quick. Um, heads up. I'm sure you are encouraged to do so on a regular basis by your own teacher's business. This is the knowledge organiser prepared by the exam board WJC for this topic I covered today. So it's the one that covers instrumental analysis. Now, it is well worth you referring to these um, after each topic and printing them off. They're, if nothing else, they're a very good short but sharp revision aid for all the topics that you study. And they are provided for nearly all topics in Unit 1 as well as Unit 2 and continues to do so throughout Unit 3 and 4 in Year 13 if you continue to study A2, of course. OK. So I appreciate that that was a bit of a whistle stop um, tour of instrumental analysis, but I will again encourage you look at those Royal Society of Chemistry videos and the links of which I've included in the presentation. Look at those videos, get better clarity if needed. OK. And as the case, um, I um, will be present in those sessions. So there are questions that remain. Um, then please don't hesitate to tune in and ask those questions to us live in two weeks time. OK, 
Um, but there is one more session remaining, which will be led again by my colleague, Mr Black. So next week's session four will focus upon making up a standard solution and titrations. Um, but any questions, as I said, please tune in for that live sessions and we will be more than ready and willing to answer any remaining queries that you may have. Thank you.